Um, this is the earliest appearance of the phrase Chinese restaurant I could find in the Auckland newspaper archives on papers past. It's an article about how the hostel for sailors needed better management. And one of the problems they identified was that the sailors were not eating in the hostel, but preferring to go to the Chinese restaurant. When I first started looking into this topic, I would have said, oh, how cool. Auckland already had a Chinese restaurant in 1888, but it's not as simple as that. And today I'm going to tell you why. Let's go back to the first known record of a Chinese person living in Auckland. He was known as James Williams. Occasionally early Chinese migrants took Pākehā names, presumably to make their life here easier. James Williams was a, was a cook. In 1862, James Williams worked for James Palmer in Crescent and was reported to be living with his brother. In 1863, he worked at the Royal Hotel in Onihunga, not related to the other Royal Ho Hotel, apparently. His boss here was Nathaniel Reed. This is a photo of the Onihunga foreshore in the 1860s, and the prominent white building is the Royal Hotel. This one right here. Most of you will be familiar with Papers Past, and it's been the number one source of information for me on this project. But the problem is that Chinese cooks pretty much only appeared in the paper when there was trouble. And indeed, James Williams was accused of stealing money and valuables belonging to his employer. The reports of his trial confirm that James Williams's job at the hotel was cook, that he earned one pound a week. And even though he rented a house at the edge of Albert Park in central Auckland, he slept at the Onehanga Hotel during was on duty. In December 1864, a Chinese man called James William James, who may have been the same person as James Williams, lived in Panmure and was a butcher. He had a servant who was also Chinese called John Jackson. Now, this is all I know about James Williams or James William James, and hopefully someday uh, more information about his life will emerge. But thanks to Graham Hughes, a descendant of John Jackson and a genealogist, we know quite a lot about John Jackson. John Jackson was born in Hong Kong about 1836. He arrived in Wellington about 1859, and by 1864, he was in Auckland, residing and working at the Governor Brown Hotel, where he met the hotel's housekeeper, Mary Ann O'Keefe, and registered his occupation on their marriage record as cook. A day earlier, on the intention to marry register, he'd given his occupation as billiard marker, an unskilled and low-paid job which was responsible for keeping scores for billiard players and topping up their drinks. And in this photo, the one with the lamp above the doorway is the Governor Brown Hotel on Hobston Street on the eastern side near the corner of Kingston Street. So it's this building here. By the end of the same year, the couple was living in Otahuhu and John was working for James William James in Panyo as a butcher's assistant. Now, we can make lots of assumptions about James Williams and James William James being the same person and whether he was related to John Jackson or just acquaintances, but we had at least two Chinese men living in Auckland, possibly four or more, and two of them were definitely professional cooks. We even have a photo of John Jackson. He would go on to live most of his life in Palmerston North with a few stints in Wellington. He and his wife Mary had four children. He spent most of his career working in hotels as a cook or billiard marker. In 1885 to 86, he briefly had his own business in Palmerston North. And in 1894, aged about 58, he worked as a cook on the sailing bark Weathersfield and traveled to London and back. By the way, Chinese cooks employed on Western ships were visitors to Auckland Harbor constantly from the 1850s to the 1950s. He never struck it rich and he died in 1910. His obituary gave his age as 85 and indicated he'd been in a comfortable and happy condition in the days before his death. It described, described him as a Chinese chef with a name for the excellence of his art. Now, just a, a bit of, of background to explain these Chinese men working as cooks. Many of the Chinese sojourners to the Americas and Australia migrated as indentured laborers 
on what became known as the credit ticket system, where white officials and employers could turn a blind eye because the whole transaction was organized by Chinese. An agent in Hong Kong arranged the ship documentation and securities from migrants. And in Australia, dedu deductions were made from their wages to the local middleman, usually trading as a merchant. A prominent historian of Chinese food in America thinks that prospective migrants in China were recruited specifically to be become cooks at their destination. That the agents knew that cooks were needed in the West and that professional cooks were trained in Western cooking before they left China. In Australia, even before the gold rushes, indentured Chinese found positions as cooks on outback stations and in country pubs. And when gold was discovered, cook shops were established serving both Chinese cuisine to the Chinese mining community and European food to non-Chinese. In New Zealand, there was no evidence of Chinese cooks arriving under indentured labor arrangements. But this ad from 1874 proves that there was a demand for Chinese cooks. And <clears throat> isn't it a mind bending portal into another era to see the words Chinaman or Daki printed in an ad in a newspaper? But let's move on to what you're all here for, Chinese restaurants. Thomas Kwoi was the first Chinese restaurant owner in Auckland. He was born sometime between 1841 and 1857 in Canton, and the best approximation of his original name we have is Yuck Kwoi. He arrived in New Zealand in about 1872, and by 1877 he was employed as a cook in two hotels in Whanganui. By 1879 he was living in Auckland and owned a Queen Street dining described as an oyster saloon. He then ran the dining rooms in the Thames Hotel from about 1880 until 1883. Briefly in 1881, he had a restaurant, maybe the same establishment, which was known as the Pekin. These hotel restaurant operations would probably have been under a lease arrangement and run by Khoi as an independent business. In early 1884, he transformed a former hairdresser's premises into the British restaurant by adding an extension that could seat 50 customers and building a kitchen that could prepare, prepare 200 meals a day. The establishment also had boarding accommodation. In late 1885, he quit that business for the opportunity to lease a newly built purpose-designed restaurant and boarding house in Victoria Street East. It had, and I quote, no less than 18 bedrooms, bathroom, linen closet, lavatories, etc. on the upper floor. On the ground floor is a spacious dining room, billiard room with one of Thurston's billiard tables, sitting rooms, servery and kitchen with range capable of cooking for 500 people. The premises have been connected with the telephone exchange, end quote. As was typical of the era, a restaurant encompassed a public dining room as well as accommodation for boarders. During the next four years, he invested in a series of these businesses. The Star Boarding House in Albert Street, the Metropolitan Club in Victoria Street, Park House, also known as the Victoria Dining Rooms in Victoria Street East, the Anchor Hotel Dining Room in Queen Street, the New Mutual Restaurant, and the Wharf Hotel Dining Rooms in Queen Street. Did you all figure out why this photo was used in the advertising for my talk today? If you look here at the bottom left, on the lamp is the name Thomas Quoy. I'm pretty sure this is the new mutual restaurant. This is Queen Street here, and this is the Victoria Arcade on the corner of Fort Street, running this way. And in this photo, um, this was designed um, to be on a big, projected on a big screen um, in an auditorium. So maybe on your screens, you might not be able to see the sign for Park House with Thomas Coy as proprietor right here on the last building on the right hand side of Victoria Street East on the corner of Kitchener Street next to the grassy slope of Albert Park. Now let's analyze these restaurants. We have an oyster saloon 
restaurants that were attached to established hotels and boarding houses. He didn't serve Chinese food. There is the question of the Pekin. It's very curious given the names of all of Koi's other businesses and indeed all the other Chinese restaurant owners I've researched around New Zealand that he chose such an unapologetically Chinese name. I don't know why or whether even he tried to serve Chinese cuisine. Now, my colleague Joanna Boileau is currently delving a bit deeper into Koi's life and um, she might be able to join us for the discussion and questions at the end. When people in Auckland in this era talked about the Chinese restaurant, as we saw in the very first slide, they simply meant a restaurant owned by a Chinese. These restaurants were neither decorated with silk lanterns, nor did they serve chop suey and chow mein, as we might imagine today. Koi and the others we're about to meet relied on Pākehā customers and theirs, therefore would have served Pākehā food. Roast or grilled beef and ham, sausages, pies, potatoes, bread rolls, tea and coffee. This was repeated by Chinese restaurant owners in other towns and indeed also in restaurants owned by Greek, Italian and Dalmatian migrants who wouldn't dare serve food, food from their homelands to Anglo customers. However, in the South Island, where there was a population of Chinese miners to serve, and Wellington, where the Chinese community was large and lived compactly enough, there were small, humble restaurants serving Chinese food. Restaurants also provided sleeping accommodation to customers, making them more like a small hotel. In fact, the terms restaurant, dining rooms, eating house, coffee house, and boarding house were interchangeable. I found businesses owned by these Chinese and their Pākehā colleagues referred to in the papers as restaurant, and then a month or two later, the very same establishment would get called a boarding house. This was typical of New Zealand in the colonial era. The word restaurant had only been in existence for about a hundred years and still held much of its original meaning of something that restores. So you could, you could be restored by food or sleep at any of hundreds of small restaurants that operated in towns and cities around New Zealand. The only distinction drawn at the time would be whether the establishment was licensed to sell alcohol. And if it was, it would be more commonly called a hotel. Pretty much all the Chinese I researched operated at the cheaper end of the market, running six penny restaurants, known as such because sixpence bought a set meal. Photos of interiors of restaurants from the era are very rare. And this one here is Chinese and it's not in Auckland. I'm just using it to give you an idea of what they were like. Sometimes racist attitudes meant Chinese owned restaurants were portrayed as unsanitary, poorly run or serving low quality food. And you had one of their competitors put this ad in the Herald. Most of you will know about the shameful history of anti-Chinese sentiment in this country, which for many years gave people license, especially young men, to go into Chinese fruit shops or restaurants and break stuff. Chinese were not safe walking down the street as they could be attacked at any time. In 1885, Thomas Coy ended up in a scuffle with a group of customers who accused him of serving sausages that weren't fresh. Now, I believe this is exactly the same thing. It had nothing to do with the quality of the food, but it was just a bunch of young men having a go just because he was Chinese. However, there was also a stereotype that Chinese had a talent for cooking and ultimately customers voted with their wallets. As a letter writer to the New Zealand Herald confirmed, quote, Boarding house and restaurant keepers are at present the only ones in which the Chinaman is in competition with Europeans in Auckland. And the bulk of the population does not feel the opposition of Chinamen. Now it is instructive to watch the people who flock to the Chinaman's eating houses, passing their own countrymen's doors, end quote. And of course, by countrymen, he meant British immigrants. Back to Thomas Coy. He also invested in commercial and residential property and undeveloped land in the suburbs. As a restaurant owner who proudly put his name on his businesses, Thomas Coy was a well-known citizen 
He donated to charities and was also considered a Chinese community leader, speaking out against the poll tax and working as an interpreter, helping Chinese migrants navigate the New Zealand bureaucratic and legal systems. In 1890, his world started to collapse when he became bankrupt. He blamed his financial difficulties on a falling off in trade, but he mostly blamed his wife, who had been his bookkeeper. They divorced, and during the divorce hearings, information became public about their sex life, which delighted the public and caused irreparable damage to Thomas Coy's reputation. Following bankruptcy, he worked as manager of the British Temperance Hotel, and in 1892, he bought a billiard room business. In 1896, he bought the Newton Baths and Billiard Room, which he would retain and operate until his death. A final brief foray into the restaurant business was the Shakespeare Temperance Hotel in Wyndham Street from 1898, but he gave that up within less than a year. And by the way, this is the correct spelling of Shakespeare Temperance Hotel. Thomas Coy's health declined, and compared to the previous decades, he lived in relative obscurity until he died in 1906. One of Thomas Coy's restaurants, the Star Dining Rooms at 64 Albert Street on the corner of Wyndham Street, by 1888 was owned by a man called Samuel Coy. He was probably born in Hong Kong around 1856. An alternate name I found for him was R. Sam, but this was a very generic made up name that was widely used by Chinese in the West. So his real name could have really been anything. He arrived in New Zealand in 1872. So the first 16 years of his time in this country are unaccounted for, and I'd love to be able to learn more about what he was up to, but no clues yet. The restaurant he presumably acquired from, or with the help of Thomas Coy. He was apparently not related to Thomas Coy. He had two marriages, both to women with English names. From at least 1888 until 1920, he had the Star Dining Rooms. The Star Dining Rooms also provided accommodation to boarders and his dining room operation would have been quite substantial, illustrated by the job advertisements he regularly placed in the newspapers. He employed a female kitchen assistant, a kitchen boy, at least two cooks, a baker, a housemaid and waitresses apparently not male waiters. There is a record that Ah Hing was his cook in 1910, but the fact that he advertised indicates that he was not providing jobs for Chinese migrants through informal networks. Most of his employees would have been Pākehā. Though note in the advertisement here that he also at one stage claimed to have Japanese cooks. In 1920, Samuel Khoi sold the star dining rooms to Willie Sun and Shaq Tai. He died two years later. His burial record indicates that he still resided at the Star at the time of his death, and he may have even still been working. Samuel Coy owned and operated the Star Dining Rooms for about 32 years, quite an achievement by today's standards and far outlasting any of his contemporaries. Perhaps because of his stability, little else was recorded about this extraordinary contributor to Auckland's hospitality industry. Our next restaurant owner, we know a bit about his background in China. Chen Da Chi was born in Dung San County in Canton in 1850. And in 1875, funded by his father, he and his two brothers were to travel to Australia via America. The story goes that because of seasickness, they decided to end their journey in Auckland. Chen Da Chi became known as Da Chi in New Zealand. Upon his arrival in Auckland, Archie found support from Thomas Coy. In 1882, Archie became naturalized, which gave him the rights, the status and rights of a British subject. And Thomas Coy also supported Archie to establish his own market garden when he helped Archie and his business partner, Arsec, to acquire the lease on land in Parnell. Family law has it that Archie's father was wealthy and had many children. Archie maintained links to his family in China and his father and brothers helped fund his projects in Auckland, as well as arrange his marriage to Jung Chu Lee. In 1886, not long after his wedding, Archie acquired the first of five restaurants, the Scandinavian in Custom Street. This is a photo from 1907, 
So this is the Thames Hotel on the corner of Queen Street East. Now the block is the Dilworth building. And here's the restaurant. In 1907, it was known as the Criterion and owned by one of Archie's associates. I'll tell you about him next. In 1886, Archie bought the Scandinavian restaurant after there had been a fire there. And thanks to the newspaper reports of the fire, we know exactly what the Scandinavian looked like. And I'll give you a closer look at the restaurant in a photo from the 1890s where Mr. D. O. D. Connor owned it. So the newspaper said, quote, Sandwiched between the New Zealand Sugar Company's offices and Chadwick's gum store, there is a two-story brick building with a conical roof and a low garret immediately beneath the gable end. It is known as the Scandinavian boarding house, end quote. The ground floor housed a shop, dining room and kitchen. And on the upper floor and in the attic, there was accommodation for lodgers. There was no indication of how many bedrooms there were, but at the time of the fire, there were only two or three lodges, so there can't have been many. When the fire broke out just before midday, the proprietor was out and his wife was in the kitchen pre preparing dinner in the company of her two little children. It appears they ran the establishment as a couple with no additional staff. Typically in restaurants like this, meals were available to both lodgers and walk-in customers. LD Nathan owned the building. Restaurateurs leased their premises. So if you look at uh, these lists of Thomas Coy's and Archie's businesses, it's easy to assume that we're looking at a stranger in a strange land with few opportunities, possibly because of racism, possibly because of limited funds, being forced to move quickly to new opportunities. But high mobility was completely normal for both Pākehā and Chinese restaurant owners. At the Scandinavian, also of note is that the building was infested with rats and mice. The newspaper said, quote, vicious looking rodents, which were scattered in all directions by the force of the fire and water. And Mr. O'Connor in the photo here makes it abundantly clear that this is a six penny restaurant. By the way, Scandinavian was just a name. There's no evidence that it was ever owned by anyone with a Scandinavian background or that it served Scandinavian cuisine. Archie would own the Scandinavian restaurant in 1886 and 1887, the Wharf dining rooms in Queen Street in late 1887, the Temperance boarding house in Wyndham Street in 1888 and 1889, Archie's dining rooms in Lower Queen Street from late 1888, and the city dining rooms in Queen Street from 1889 to 1891. All of these were small establishments that traded in both meals and accommodation. They were all bought and sold as going concerns. And since race is looming large in our topic today, interestingly, while of course the vast majority of restaurant owners were Pākehā, Archie bought the sitting city dining rooms from a black man, Samuel Cox, who had settled in Auckland and made restaurants his career. As I said at the start, all these Chinese restaurateurs served Pākehā food. I have evidence from other restaurants around New Zealand, but this is one rare bit of evidence that shows us exactly what was on our cheese table. Steak was part of the standard repertoire of grills served at many New Zealand restaurants at the time. Turtle soup was a bit fancier. A delicacy in Britain and North America, turtle meat was quite bland and the soup was spiced with red pepper. Even though mock turtle soup made with a boiled calf's head was, common, was a common substitute, our cheese soup was most likely made with real turtles from tropical Australia. Our Chinese restaurant owners were pa sorry, our Chinese restaurant owners' customers were Pākehā, and they served what their customers wanted. This ad shows that our chi also knew he had to compete on price. The last recorded reference to Archie as a restaurant keeper was in December 1892. The dining rooms were strategically located near the wharves and across the road from the railway station, which was soon to be moved for the site to become the central post office. After only seven years as a restaurant operator, he converted his last restaurant to a retail fruit shop, and the company, from 1912 in the hands of sons and a nephew, 
maintained a shop in the block until the 1930s. Now, uh, I, uh, I'm just moving some boxes around. So this is Queen Street running up here, the Thames Hotel on the corner of Custom Street. And uh, if the picture was larger on this white awning here, you could see uh, that this is Archie's dining rooms. Archie retired to China, which was considered the ultimate goal of all Chinese sojourners to New Zealand, but very few actually achieved. All of Archie's sons and all his grandchildren went into fruit and veg retail, and his first garden at the foot of the domain in Stanley Street underwent an archaeological dig a few years ago and produced lots of fascinating information, which means that Aucklanders invariably associate the Archie name with market gardening and retail. But during the seven years I have just described, his public profile was that he was a restaurant keeper. He also had many other business interests, banana and ginger plantations and ginger pickling factories in Fiji for direct supply to his open shops. He imported fireworks, Chinese groceries and Canadian chilled eggs. He bred rabbits to export the skins. He farmed sheep and poultry. He bought wood ear fungus for export to China. He traded scrap metal and glass, and he invested in mining and a racehorse. I'm starting to see Archie as a businessman whose most successful ventures just happened to be in food. So the Scandinavian and Custom Street was taken over by Connor in the 1890s, and then the building became a bicycle shop. By 1901, it was turned back into a restaurant by Thomas Wan Kwai, a native of Shanghai, whose date of arrival in New Zealand is unknown, but who married Margaret McMenemy in Auckland in 1895. Thomas Wan Kwai was an associate of Archie, which may have been the connection to his investment in this restaurant. The couple called the restaurant the Criterion and ran it with a few staff until 1911, when they sailed on a year-long trip around the world. Upon return, they bought a restaurant at 289 Queen Street, which was then by the city's produce market, now Aotea Square, which then ran for only about a year until Thomas Wan Kwai's death in 1913. So in summary, these gentlemen I've discussed here are a small representation of the many Chinese restaurant owners in colonial New Zealand. I did some digging into numbers from censuses and in 1896, when the 3,685 Chinese men and 26 Chinese women in New Zealand made up half of a percent of the population, 5% of all people who gave their occupation as restaurant owner were Chinese. Now this is disregarding hotels. There were a few Chinese hotel keepers, but the tens of thousands of Pākehā hotel landlords were a different kettle of fish altogether. The Chinese diaspora in the 19th century is often described as doing jobs that white people were unwilling to do. One thing I'm not too sure about is what status Pākehā cooks and restaurateurs had within society, but an educated guess would be that it was not high status. But these figures in any case show that in this case, Chinese were not filling undesirable work. The Chinese cooks and restaurant owners in other parts of the country confirmed some of the traits we've seen in our Auckland gentlemen. Whereas the history we're normally told has Ch the Chinese keeping to themselves on gold diggings or in market gardens, the cooks often worked for Pākehā bosses and the restaurant owners often had Pākehā employees. They all served Pākehā cuisine to Pākehā customers. Many of them married Pākehā women. They were much more willing to invest money and participate in the Pākehā world than the classic sojourner Chinese who just wanted to make his fortune and return to China. A lot of the market gardens and fruit shops were run by partnerships. Several men had a stake. There are a few clues that our cheese restaurants might have been partnerships with others, but for all the other gentlemen I talked about today, there is no indication that they were in partnership with anyone. Like many of the contemporaries around, New around the country, most of our gentlemen today arrived in New Zealand before the poll tax was instituted in 1881 and were naturalized as British subjects. So they would have felt much more secure of their place 
than many of the Chinese diaspora who suffer, suffered terrible, le terrible legally sanctioned exclusion and restriction. But at the same time, I don't want you to forget that all these men I researched were also part of a very tight, lo loyal local community of Chinese migrants. These men were not clueless peasants who washed up in Auckland desperate to take any work. They were worldly travelers with lots of experiences and lots of shared knowledge from the wide network of other Chinese migrants. They probably knew before they left China that cooking food was a possible option in New Zealand. John Jackson, Thomas Coy and Samuel Coy made careers out of the restaurant trade. Archie and Thomas Wan Kwai dabbled, but also explored other opportunities. So this research is part of a larger project funded by the Chinese Poltax Heritage Trust to hopefully record the full story of Chinese restaurants. I'm currently researching the period of World War II. I've been joined by Joanna Boileau, who, as I mentioned earlier, is looking into Thomas Coy in a bit more detail, and is also researching Otago and the West Coast, where there were businesses set up, including restaurants, to serve the large numbers of Chinese miners passing through. New Zealand Chinese continued to work as cooks throughout the 20th century, but not in the same numbers as the 1880s and 90s. Chinese restaurant ownership dropped right off. One obvious reason for this was that owning laundries emerged as a good niche that Chinese could get into. In Grays Avenue, there were a few Chinese restaurants that catered to Chinese customers from about the 1920s, but they were very clandestine and makeshift. I'm building a picture of the food they served, and there's no reason to believe it wasn't authentic. In some ways, it reminds me of the 1990s when all these Started popping up that didn't even have signs in English. No concession to Pākehā diners at all. During World War II, New Zealand Chinese started opening chop suey restaurants. Chinese cuisine was suddenly trendy among Pākehā. Although, as we we're all aware, the cuisine in those restaurants was pretty bastardised. Chinese knew what they were doing. They had a long history of catering to Pākehā tastes. So that's the end of my talk uh, on the very early restaurants. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, if any of you have memories, I'd love for you to share them, no matter how small. They will all add up to the bigger picture. Please email me. It's much easier for me to have your information in writing because then it's easier for me to save and interpret it and you will be cited in my work.